Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Genesis. You may know that Genesis in Greek means beginnings. So this is the book of the beginning. And in this lesson, lesson number 10 for June 4 of 2022, we're going to talk again about Jacob and find that his name is changed to Israel. Hmm. As always, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for these insights that you preserve for us in the record. We think of this book of Genesis, so brief, covering some almost half of this world's history, maybe more than half of this world's history, in that one book. And yet, these lessons so profound May we gather what we need to learn from these lessons is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, guess what? We continue the life of Jacob in this lesson, well, what we've done in previous lessons, after, now after he left Laban and returned to Canaan. And what was the biggest problem when he left Laban and headed back for Canaan? What was he concerned about? Well... Laban and Laban's sons thought that, uh, basically thought that Jacob was embezzling mm -hmm. or stealing their, their wealth and Laban's wealth, and they yeah. weren't very happy with him. And why didn't Jacob go back to Canaan earlier? Because of his brother he, Esau, who yeah. he knew what was there. lied and stolen the birthright. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to notice that God appeared to Laban and told him not to cause trouble for Jacob. We don't have time in this lesson to go back and review each of those things, but that's one of the things that happened. Later, God appeared to Jacob, seeming to wrestle with him. We'll talk about quite a bit about that. And about the same time, God appeared to Esau, telling him not to attack or injure Jacob or his family. What does this tell us about God's concern for each of us individually? Have any of you had... Um, I would like to have God come and tell me. Well, and I've asked this question before, and I'd love to have, I mean, even 10 minutes a week or 10 minutes a month, a month of God coming and giving us directions. Okay, I'd like to do this and this and this. That'd be wonderful. But guess who else would demand equal time? How would you like to spend even 10 minutes a month with the devil? Seems like a person really developed the their own character with uh, always having God micromanaging their their affairs. God, well, it, yeah. This is God's foreknowledge. And that's what's really miraculous, the things God can foretell the future, like Genesis, or uh, excuse me, Job 1 and 2. He knows what's, what the future holds, and uh, but he doesn't have to manipulate. Mm -hmm. He can intervene at times, but I don't, it, it's not at the level of manipulation. Well, I, would you I, consider a manipulation if he tells Laban, don't, 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 don't kill Jacob, don't give him trouble, or Esau, be nice to him? Is that manipulation? No, well, I wouldn't think so. I would, it's still, that's not the way to go, mm -hmm. but, yeah. uh, and then ha see how the guy is still free to respond uh, negatively or positively. Well, the most unusual thing by far in this story is what happens next. Jacob's struggle that night with Christ is described as the time of Jacob's trouble. A time like that will come again to the people living in the final days of this world's history. Jim, you want to tell us about that time? Uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 5 to 7. I heard a cry of terror, a cry of fear, and not of peace. Now stop and think. Can a man give birth to a child? Why then do I see every man with his hand on his stomach like a woman in labor? Why is everyone so pale? Terrible day is coming. Excuse me, a terrible day is coming. No other day can compare with it. A time of distress for my people, but they will survive. American Bible Society, Good News Translation. Thank you. Wow. That doesn't sound like something to look forward to, does it? What they're trying to, if you go back up to the first part of that, uh, that's there, can a man give birth to a child? Now <laughs> they, they would have you think so. Yeah. In the popular 
TV stuff and so forth, and movies, oh man, craziness. God's promises held true for Jacob Israel. Try to imagine Jacob's thoughts as he got closer and closer to Esau. He was the only one of his entourage or his large company who knew about Esau in detail and about the, their previous experiences and conflicts. And I'm sure he told them, the family, but it's not the same just telling somebody about it as experiencing it yourself. Jacob sent a group of messengers several different times ahead of them with gifts for Esau. And what was the response, Carrie? Reading from Genesis 32, verse 6. When the messengers came back to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau, and he is already on his way to meet you. He has 400 men with him. That's from the Good News Bible. Whoa. 400 peacekeepers, I'm sure. Yes, of course. <laughs> and how did the Lord respond? Dwayne? That same night, Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two concubines, and his eleven children, and cro crossed the river Jabbok. After he had sent them across, he also sent across all that he owned, but he stayed behind alone. Then I, I should interrupt there for a second. I had the privilege of visiting the Jabbok uh, one time when I was with a tour group. I don't know how it was in those days, but it's not much of a river now. You could wade across real easily. Well, the Santa Ana River right here is pretty much like that. It's pretty little most of the time, but sometimes it's a yeah. rushing torrent. And you've probably heard the famous kid story about the little girl comes rushing into the house and says to her mom, Mommy, Mommy, Johnny fell into the Santa Ana River. Mom says, well, pick him up and dust him off. He'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to Javik. Then a man came and wrestled with him until just before daybreak. When the man saw that he was not winning the struggle, he struck Jacob on the hip, and it was thrown out of joint. Now, I'm going to interrupt here to mention two things. I should have, I thought I had these bolded and something happened here. Notice, then a man, and then later, the man. Okay? And what's this man doing? Just touches his hip and... Now, there's, there's something we need to mention here, and I'm not going to go into it in any length uh, detail. In the Bible study guide, it suggests that, and this is true, you remember in the days of Abraham, he talked about when he was he's getting ready to send his servant to go and get a wife for, for Isaac, he says he put his hand under his thigh. Well, that's an expression that clearly means put his hand on his genital area. And our lesson suggests that maybe that was the same thing that happened here. But I doubt it because putting your hand on someone's genital area doesn't throw your hip out of joint. So I... Isn't that more of a, a contract, an agreement? That's the way they... Yeah, yeah. Well, it was exactly. more probably more than the nature of a threat rather than an agreement. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we at a you, you do agree, don't you? <laughs> yeah. They may make him an offer that he can't refuse type of thing. <laughs> okay. Well, his hip was thrown out of joint, and then go ahead. Uh, let's see. The man. Uh, it's the third time. It was out of joint, yes. The man said, let me go. Daylight is coming. I won't unless you bless me, Jacob answered. What is your name? The man asked. Jacob, he answered. The man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob. You have struggled with God and with men, and you have won, so your name will be Israel. Jacob said, Now, let, let, now tell me your name. I mean, that seems reasonable, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Fought with him all night. <laughs> After he says, you've struggled with God, yeah. you know, saying, I, I'm God, is what yeah. the man was saying. Yeah. But he answered, why do you want to know my name? Then he blessed Jacob. Jacob said, I have seen God face to face, and I am still alive. So he named the place Peniel. 
The sun rose as Jacob was leaving Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. So that's, again, why I think it's probably something more to do with the joint. Um, I'm thinking about Moses a few generations later, and God says, you can't see me. I'll put you in a little spot here, and I'll pass by, and you could see my back. But he spends the whole night fighting with Jacob here, and Jacob says, what? I have seen God face to face. What's going on here? Okay, well, you want to read us Hosea as well? Their ancestor Jacob struggled with his twin brother Esau while the two of them were still in their mother's womb. When Jacob grew up, he fought against God. He fought against an angel and won. He wept and asked for a blessing. And at Bethel, God came to our ancestor Jacob and spoke with him. Okay, from the Good News Bible. At some point in his struggle with Christ, Jacob must have recognized there was no ordinary human being with whom he was wrestling. And, I mean, imagine the God of the universe coming down and fighting with Jacob. Why? And why would Jacob... I mean, is this what guys do? They just wrestle with each other? Well, <laughs> Jacob was kind of expecting Esau to be in that area. Yeah. And, you know, is he fighting for his life against who he thought was Esau? Probably. Until, until when? Until he struck his hip. At some point in his struggle with Christ, Jacob must have recognized that it was no ordinary human being with whom he was wrestling. Gordon? Myra? I'm sorry, Myra. It is precisely at this moment that God chooses to approach Jacob. This extraordinary confrontation will radically change the character of Jacob. As a result, Jacob is named Israel. Jacob's encounter with God at Peniel corresponds to his Bethel encounter. The two That's with the latter, remember? It, okay. The two accounts echo each other in words, structure, and themes. Why Bethel begins at sunset, Peniel ends at sunrise, with the prospect of a glorious future. After a night of wrestling, Jacob emerges from his encounter with a blessing and a new name. He has had a personal encounter with the God of love and lived. In turn, Jacob is able to look upon the face of his enemy, his brother Esau, in humility and love. From the Adult Teacher's Battle Study Guide. Yeah. Now, I don't know, you're the only couple here, Myra and Gordon. Um, what would you say if you woke up and either your husband or your wife said, Oh, I had an encounter with God last night and he changed my name. And you would say... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should change husbands also. <laughs> Maybe you need, Maybe you need to, to visit. go back to bed. <laughs> you go back to bed or yeah, call, a psychiatrist. call a psychiatrist. I mean, you know. But I mean, he had to do that at some point to tell him that that was the situation. How did he do that? How did he tell everybody, no, my name has changed? I hadn't thought about that. How did you tell people that your name was changed? It was expected. From, from Jocelyn to Peterson. Yeah, it was expected. You know, you take on the husband's name, but... Yeah. Well, there are parts of the world where it doesn't work like that. Yeah. We have some close friends who come from Eritrea, which is the, what used to be the northern part of Ethiopia. And I don't... I thought the sons and the daughters take their father's first name as their last name. So it's hard to trace through the family because every generation, the name changes. Hmm. So you have your name and your father's first name as your last name. Hmm. So, what happened that night beside the Jabbok River? What was, God, what was God trying to teach Jacob as they wrestled together? Did Jacob know with whom he was fighting? Well, eventually he did. Why did he approach Jacob at that, in that way? 
Does God usually appear to us as an adversary? Think about the experience with Joshua. He's all military, dressed up, ready to go, ready to attack the city of, of Jericho. And what is he? He runs into a, a soldier, what appears to be a soldier. Uh, what's going on here, you know? Was there any special significance to this nighttime battle? Why did God change Jacob's name at that point? Why did he apparently refuse to tell Jacob his name? I mean, all kinds of questions about this experience. Notice Jacob's response at the end of their conversation. Quote, I have seen God face to face and I'm still alive. Wow. I don't remember Abraham expressing that. No. He didn't. The we, the, at least that we have record of. Was God just playing with Jacob? Is there any way that Jacob could have, in fact, wrestled with God and overcome him? Why was he given the name God struggles or may God struggle? How do you understand Gen Genesis 32, 28? Well, from the Adult Teacher's Bible Study Guide, Jacob's distress derives from two causes. The first is horizontal and is related to his brother. The second is vertical and relates to God. Jacob's first concern is with his brother, to whom he sends two companies of messengers. This initiative is a strategic operation to safeguard the second camp. <clears throat> In the event that the first camp is attacked, the second camp will have time to escape. Jacob decides to send, quote, two camps of messengers, end quote, to Esau. Jacob calls his two camps of human messengers by the same name, uh, Mach Machena, camps, Genesis 32, 7, and 8. Jacob understands that in order to recover his relationship with God, he must restore his relationship with his brother. Okay. There's something about loving God and loving our brothers, right? Jesus talked about that. Jacob struggled there at the river Jabbok because he knew that God had instructed him to return to Haran, from Haran, I'm sorry, to Canaan. And yet, he saw a danger ahead. Jacob reminded God that he had promised him a posterity and likely he would have no offspring if Esau attacked them. Jacob so there, had de There's danger ahead and there's danger behind. Exactly. Jacob had divided his family and workers into two separate groups in the hope that if Esau should attack one group, the other group might be able to escape. After sending these two camps ahead of him, Jacob remained behind on the other side of the Jabbok where he wrestled with God. So why would come God come down and apparently wrestle with Jacob? There can be no question but the fact that it was Christ himself, even though he was referred to as a man. The information that this man, now capitalized, which we know was God, did not prevail contains an important theological lesson about God and his relationship with humans. God's weakness in his confrontation with humans is an expression of his grace and love and of the mystery of, in, of his incarnation to save human beings, to save humans. That's quite a process. It, what, what's, what's the basis for the God's weakness in trying to save human beings? What is God's limitation in saving humans? Our freedom. Our freedom, exactly. If we choose to rebel against him, if we choose to reject him, that's God's weakness. He says, I'm sorry, I refuse to take away your freedom. I don't want robots. I want people who can love him, love me. And love is impossible without freedom. The impression of weakness is immediately contradicted by the man's next move. A simple touch is sufficient to produce the dislocation, suggesting a superhuman power. Again, from the adult teacher's Sabbath School Bible Society Guide, page 134. Well, Jacob sent several parties with large gifts to Esau. Uh, Jim? Genesis 32, verses 4, 18, and 20. He instructed them to say, I, Jacob, your obedient servant, report to my master Esau that I have been staying with Laban and that I have delayed my return until now. Now, let me interrupt there for a second. Does this sound like there's a something has changed? Jacob was his mother was told, 
the older will serve who? The younger. The younger. And Jacob purchased his birthright. And now what is he saying? I, Jacob, your obedient servant. Well, he's been gone for 20 years. 20 years. And, you know, his family actually might not have known where he was. Mm -hmm. And so he's... Or, or what his condition was. Yeah, he's coming, he may be coming back from the dead. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Verse 18, you must answer. <laughs> they belong to your servant Jacob. He sends them as a present to his master Esau. Jacob himself is just behind us. He gave the same order to the second the third, and all, and to all the others that were in charge of the herds. This is what you must say to Esau when you meet him. You must say, yes, your servant Jacob is just behind us. Jacob was thinking, I will win him over with gifts. And wh when I meet him, perhaps he will forgive me. Good news, Bible. In the morning, Jacob moved forward to meet his brother. They had been separated for 20 years. What connection was there between Jacob's experience of seeing the face of God at Peniel and Jacob's experience of seeing the face of, the, of his brother? What is the implication of this connection regarding our relationship with God and our relationship with our brothers, whoever they may be? Carrie? The two companies at last approached each other, the desert chief leading his men of war and Jacob with his wives and children attended by shepherds and handmaidens, and followed by long lines of flocks and herds. Leaning upon his staff, the patriarch went forward to meet the band of soldiers. He was pale and disabled from his recent conflict, and he walked slowly and painfully, halting at every step. But his countenance was lighted up with joy and peace. At sight of that crippled sufferer, Esau ran to meet him and they embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. That's Genesis 33, 4. As they looked upon the scene, even the heart, hearts of Esau's rude soldiers were touched. Notwithstanding he had told them of his dream, they could not account for the change that came over their captain. Though they beheld the patriarch's infirmity, they little thought that his weakness had been made his strength. It's from Ellen White's Patriarch and Prophets, page 198, paragraphs 3 to 4. So what's happened here? Esau comes out with his army and he's going to get this guy. And then he sees him that here he is limping along. Poor guy, it looks like he's about one foot in the grave. He doesn't need to be attacked, right? Go ahead. Jacob bows himself seven times before his brother. That's from Genesis 33, 3, whom he calls several times, my Lord. Again, Genesis, Genesis 33, 8, 13, 15, and with whom he identifies himself as his servant. Significantly, Jacob's seven bows echo his father's second seven, rather, blessings. From Genesis 27, 27, 29. Furthermore, when he bows, he specifically, no, spe yes, it was, specifically reverses his father's blessing about nations bowing down to you. That's from okay. Genesis 27, 29. Okay, now you can take that however seriously you want. I think se seven was a very important number in the Bible, and so they often did things in sevens. I don't know that there's a big deal that these two occasions just happen to both be sevens. When Jacob approached his brother Esau, limping, and Esau saw him, he came running to Jacob, embraced him, and kissed him. To Jacob, that was like seeing the face of God. I mean, considering what he's been so deathly afraid of, what an experience. Dwayne? The error that had led to Jacob's sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud was now clearly set before him. He had not trusted God's promises, but had sought by his own efforts to bring about that which God would have accomplished in his own time and way. 
Okay, Patriarchs and Prophets 197, 198. Want to go ahead? Satan had accused Jacob before the angels of God, claiming the right to destroy him because of his sin. He had moved upon Esau to march against him, and during the Patriarch's long night of wrestling, Satan endeavored to force upon him a sense of his guilt in order to discourage him and break his hold upon God. Okay, now I'm going to stop here a moment. We got the two major contestants in the great controversy here at this spot. We've got Christ apparently fighting with Jacob and who's there also trying to do his best to inflict all kinds of problems on him? Satan. Satan. Claiming the right to destroy him because of his sins. Well, yep. And he's, there, there were lots of them. Yeah, and, and this, is, this is straight from Zechariah 3. Satan, who is it that accuses every one of us in heaven? Satan. Satan. Okay, go ahead. Had not Jacob previously repented of his sin in obtaining the birthright by fraud, God could not have heard his prayer and mercifully preserved his life. Okay, I'm going to interrupt there. Why would that be true? Because the devil would have said, God, he's not on your side. Mm -hmm. You have no right to interfere. That's force, using your force on him. But God could now say, because Jacob had repented, look, he is on my side. He mm -hmm. wants me to do this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dwayne? So, in the time of trouble, if the people of God had unconfessed sins to appear before them while tortured with fear and anguish, they would be overwhelmed. Despair would cut off their faith, and they could not have confidence to plead with God for deliverance. But while they have a deep sense of their unworthiness, they will have no concealed wrongs to reveal. Their sins will have been blotted out by the atoning blood of Christ, and they cannot bring them to remembrance. Hmm, that's an interesting idea. Their sins will be blotted about by the atoning blood of Christ, and they cannot bring them to remembrance. How much of our past lives are we going to have to forget? <laughs> Temporarily, much of it. <laughs> I see. Okay, well, Satan's not done yet. Dwayne, go ahead. Satan leads many to believe that God will overlook their unfaithfulness in the minor affairs of life. But the Lord shows in his dealing with Jacob that he can in no wise sanction or tolerate evil. All who endeavor to excuse or conceal their sins and permit them to remain upon the books of heaven, unconfessed and unforgiven, will be overcome by Satan. The more exalted their profession and the more honorable the position which they hold, the more grievous is their course in the sight of God and the more certain the triumph of the great adversary. Okay, now, what kind of uh, honorable positions do we hold when we try to speak about the truth to people? What are we trying to do? Trying to persuade them. Yeah. Go ahead. Yet Jacob's history is an assurance that God will not cast off those who have been betrayed into sin but who have returned unto him with true repentance. It was by self-surrender and confiding faith that Jacob gained what he had failed to gain by conflict in his own strength. God has thus taught his servant that divine power and grace alone could give him the blessing he craved. Thus it will be for the, with those who live in the last days. As dangers surround them and despair seizes upon the soul, they must depend solely upon the merits of the atonement. We can do nothing of ourselves. In all our helpless unworthiness, we must trust in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior. None will ever perish while they do this. The long black catalog of their delinquencies is before the eye of the infinite. Okay, I'm going to stop there for a oh, interrupt for a moment. Dr. Maxwell used to talk about the expression in the passage in Zechariah 3, the first five verses. And there it says that Satan comes and he's the one who accuses us. 
And Dr. Maxwell says, and Satan's memory is not perfect, but God's memory is perfect. So when Satan gets done accusing us, God said, you forgot a few of their sins. Let me, you know, God could have given more detail and, 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 and more, because he knows, he even knows the, the motives. God does. Satan can't read the motives. God can read the motives. He knows all that. And what, how does he respond? Satan, I condemn you. He turns in and rebukes Satan. He doesn't rebuke us, he rebukes Satan. Of course, that's assuming that we want to have that kind of relationship with God. So this long black catalog of our delinquencies is before the eye of the infinite. That could be scary, right? But it's not. Go ahead. The register is complete. None of our offenses are forgotten. But he who listened to the cries of his servants of old will hear the prayer of faith and pardon our transgressions. He has promised, and he will fulfill his word. Now, many of you probably grew up with the idea that I, like I grew up with, that, okay, every night you get down beside your bed and you say your prayers, and God is going to take a giant eraser and he's going to erase all those sins and nobody knows about them anymore. What does this say? The long black list is what? Not forgotten. Not forgotten. Wow. God's memory is not failing. He doesn't have any problems. He's still, he's still omniscient. He knows everything. And certainly if you happen to be a saint and are described in the Bible, your sins aren't for, forgotten. They're right. recorded for eternity. And so we go on to the next step. Because if you really believe that God has to wipe out all traces of sin, then there's going to have to be a giant Bible burning before we enter the New Jerusalem because the Bible is full of the sins of the, of the saints. Okay? Jacob prevailed because he was persevering and determined. His experience testifies to the power of important, persistent, insistent, tenacious prayer. It is now that we are to learn this lesson of prevailing prayer, of unyielding faith. The greatest victories to the Church of Christ or to the individual Christian are not those that are gained by talent or education, by wealth or the favor of men. They are those victories that are gained in the audience chamber with God when earnest, agonizing faith lays hold upon the mighty arm of power. Those who are unwilling to forsake every sin and to seek earnestly for God's blessing will not obtain it. But all who will lay hold of God's promises as did Jacob, and be as earnest and persevering as he was, will succeed as he succeeded. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Okay, Myra, why don't you take out that? Oh, that was from Patriarchs and yeah. Prophets. Yeah, 201 to 203, okay. I'll read that last little paragraph. Yes. <laughs> I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary. And then will come the seven last plagues. I'm going to interrupt here, going to interrupt here for a moment again. We mentioned way back at the beginning the time of Jacob's trouble. Now Ellen White's going to talk about that. Um these plagues and then will come the seven last plagues these plagues enraged the wi the wickedness against the righteous they thought that they had brought the judgments of god upon them and that if they could rid the earth of us the plagues would then be stayed a decree went forth to slay the saints which caused them to cry day and night for deliverance this was the time of Jacob's trouble. Ellen G. White, early, early writings. writings. And that was a portion she wrote way in the very early, very early years of her life. There are several people listed in the scripture who had their names changed by God. Abraham, Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, Jacob to Israel. Uh, that was... Um, Hosea, Hosea to Joshua, Saul to Paul, Peter to Simon, 
to mention a few. Why did God change people's names? Reading from Genesis 33, 1 through 17. Jacob saw Esau coming with his 400 men, so he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two concubines. He put the concubines and their children first, then Leah and her children, and finally Rachel and Joseph at the rear. Jacob went ahead of them and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet him, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. They were both crying. <clears throat> when Esau looked round and saw the women and the children, he asked, who are these people with you? Yeah. <laughs> these, sir, are the children whom God has been good enough to give me, Jacob answered. Then the concubines came up with their children and bowed down. Then Leah and her children came. And last of all, Joseph and Rachel came and bowed down. Esau asked, what about the other group I met? What did that mean? Jacob answered, it was to gain your favor. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother, keep what you have. Jacob said, no, please, if, you have gained, if I have gained your favor, accept my gift. To see your face is for me like seeing the face of God, now that you have been so friendly to me. Wow. Please accept this gift which I have brought for you. God has been kind to me and given me everything I need, except children. Mm -hmm. except, us, uh, except Benjamin. Uh, Jacob kept on urging him until he accepted. Esau said, let's prepare to leave. I will go ahead of you. Jacob answered, you know that the children are weak and I must think of the sheep and cattle with their young. If they are driven hard for even one day, the whole herd will die. <clears throat> Please go on ahead of me and I will follow slowly, going as fast as I can, with the livestock and the children until I catch up with you and eat them. Okay, now, two or three questions in that special. First of all, where's Edom? Isn't that in current day Jordan? Okay, it's in the southern part of Jordan. Was Isaac, I mean, was Jacob headed there? Not intending to. No, he don't, we don't have any record that he ever went there. So is Jacob being deceitful here? And the other bigger question is, how did Esau know that Jacob was coming? He had his spies out. Yeah, he had his spies out. He said he's a drone over there to see them. Yeah. No. How did he know? We, we, we don't know I mean, how these things happened. Now, we do know that Jacob, you know, just a little while before this, in the last few days, had sent, tried to send some people ahead with gifts to Esau. Was that his first knowledge that something is coming? Well, somehow he got the word that, that Esau's men are, are not far away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how did they get that message? They, as you imply, there weren't drones or... Well, or internet, or et cetera, people, cell phones. We read specifically that the, the people who had taken some gifts to Esau, they came back and they said, oh, he's on his way here. But how did Jacob know to send the people yeah. to Esau? And where to send them? them? Were there merchants traveling around? Were there camel trains and whatever? Maybe, maybe. If that wasn't the usual way, they, I mean, the, the, What's what's called the Royal Road, or the or the what? The, there's another name for it. Highway. Went went down, what the King's Highway went down along the coast, and this area, not not over here. So, well, how about uh, to east of the Jordan, east of the Dead Sea, was it? And that uh, they ended there up. Was, over, there was a road down yeah, there as yeah. well, but that wasn't the main road. But okay. maybe. Anyway, apparently, you know, Jacob felt like he didn't need a guard to. March ahead of him anyway, did he? Yeah. Verse, verse 11, Please accept this gift that I have brought for you. God has been kind to me and given me everything I need. Jacob kept on urging him until he, that is Esau, accepted. Esau said, Let's prepare to leave. I will go ahead of you. Jacob answered, You know that the children are weak. Oh, we already read that, didn't we? It's all right. Yeah. Verse 14, Please go ahead of me and I will follow slowly, going as fast as I can with the livestock and the children until I catch up with you and eat, eat them. Esau said, let me leave some of my men with you. 
But Jacob answered, There is no need for that, for I only want to gain your favor. So that day Esau started on his way back to Edom, but Jacob went to Succoth, where he built a house for himself and shelters for his livestock. That is why the place was named Succoth. That's the Good News Bible. Okay. So Jacob, it doesn't say this, but Succoth, I'm quite sure, in fact, I'm almost positive, is on the other side of the Jordan River. So he's crossed the Jordan River, left Esau on the eastern side, and he's building a house for himself and space for his animals. Is that doesn't sound like he's planning to go down to Edom. So was that just um, a congenial kind of gre greeting? See you with, later. Yeah, see you later kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming and, and offering yeah. to yes. send your guards with me to yes. make sure I go where I'm supposed to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there might have been things, other, other parts of that thing that we don't have recorded here. If he said, okay, I'll accept some of your men, those men almost certainly would have taken him straight to Edom. He didn't want to go to Edom, <coughs> as far as we know. Of course, we also have to rem remember, as you've said, that the book of Genesis, which this is, is covering thousands of years of history. Mm -hmm. It can't record every word, yeah. every, every encounter. Well, when, when uh, uh, Joseph, with his coat of many colors, that thing, mm -hmm. where, where was that, that incident? Wasn't that far, farther south there, maybe closer? Farther south, but also farther west. Okay. Quite a bit further west. Yeah, clearly on the other side of the Jordan. Well, go ahead. Do you want to finish that off? Uh, so now instead of the Bible from the Bible study guide for Monday, Jacob's experience of God's forgiveness at Peniel, where he saw the face of God, is now repeated in his experience of his brother's forgiveness, which he identifies as if he saw the face of God. Jacob lives a second Peniel, the first one preparing for the second one. Jacob has been forgiven by God and by his own brother. Truly, he now must have understood even more than before the meaning of grace. Okay. After successfully meeting Esau and then moving on to establish a place in Canaan, Jacob purchased a piece of land from the inhabitants, Genesis thirty-three nineteen. Now, what do we know about his ancestors who had purchased property? Abraham. Abraham purchased a piece of property for what purpose? For his grave for Sarah. For a place to bury his wife and a place where he would later be buried, okay? Do we have any indication that Isaac purchased any property? We don't. However, we do have the time where he his people dug wells and, and then, remember, his enemies came and tried to take over the wells and so forth like this. So I guess that represents some kind of ownership. Uh, they argued about who the well should belong to. Now we have Jacob again coming and purchasing a piece of property. So what is this? This tells us that the family is trying to more and more fervently, more and more strongly establish the fact that they belong in Canaan. Okay, for the first time in his life, Jacob or Israel has, was exposed to the troubles of settling into the land. He did his best to find accommodation with the surrounding Canaanite neighbors. It reminds us of the experience of Isaac and Abimelech as recorded in Genesis 26. Read the story of, of Genesis in Genesis 34. Dinah, Jacob's only daughter, wanted to have an opportunity to spend time with other young women. Myra, can you understand that? But she was apparently a beautiful young woman and was very attractive to Shechem, the king's son. He would not control his he could not control his passions, or at least he would not, and he attacked her and raped her. This was probably considered to be okay in his culture. Remember, we're talking about places with fertility cult religions here. As a result, her older brothers, Simeon and Levi, tricked the Shechemites into circumcising themselves as they could become a part of the Israelite community. And then Simeon and Levi attacked them and destroyed all the men, taking the property and the women back with them to their camp. Ooh. What a wonderful story, right? 
The story of this sordid incident highlights the ambiguity of the characters and of their actions. The sensual Shechem, who violates Dinah, also is characterized as sincere and loving Dinah, and he wants to try to make amends. He is even willing to undergo the covenant rite of circumcision. Meanwhile, Simeon and Levi, who present themselves as the defenders of God and his commandments, and who resist intermarriage with the Canaanites, resort to lies and deception, and are ready to kill and plunder, Genesis 34, 25 through 27. Their actions were not only reprehensible, why not punish the one man who had done it, but also had the potential to cause many more problems. Wow from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Tuesday, May 31. Sincere repentance involves moving away from sin, I'm sorry, away from and eliminating sin. God protected Jacob and his family after the Shechemite debacle. In these stories, we see not only acts of kindness and grace, but also acts of deceit and deception. What does this tell us about human nature? None of us would deceive or do anything like anything like that, right? So God can overlook this, but not eating the wrong, from the wrong tree? Wow. Good question. As a result of that experience at Shechem, Jacob feared for his life and decided to move his family to Bethel. He, he felt comfortable at Bethel, remember. At Bethel, Rebekah's elderly nurse, Deborah, died. And we don't know for sure why Rebekah's nurse is... We know that Rebekah was dead, but why does her nurse all of a sudden now... I mean, you would have thought that he would, she would be back taking care of Isaac. Anyway, Rebekah's elderly nurse, Deborah, died. Maybe Isaac is dead. I don't... No, Isaac wasn't dead by this time. He lived into, into past the time when, when Jacob was taken, in, taken down to, to as, a, as a slave into Egypt. And the blessing that was given to Abraham and to Isaac, promising that the entire land would be theirs, is now repeated to Jacob. Jacob did what he could to eliminate all false religious practices. He told all those in his camp to put away their Canaanite idols. And where did they get Canaanite idols? What do we know about so far? Rachel brought them from, uh, some of them from... Uh, from Haran. Uh, yeah, Haran. Yeah, exactly. It mentions that she they said, probably... I, I, I hid them from Laban. But then they, yeah, Laban right. Come look and try to... Yeah, exactly. More deception. More deception. But it says here probably also they... they those are the kind of things they would probably take from the, after they killed all the men of the Shechemites, they took the women and carried them back over to do what? Work as slaves for their family or something? Why? I don't know. So anyway, he says, okay, there give me... Missionary mission service that they were doing there with them. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So apparently they had probably had stolen some or taken some gods from, I mean, it's the kind of stuff, if you look at the ancient museums, these are small little things formed, you know, primarily formed to, uh, with women, women, of women and with their sexual features, breasts and so forth, they or, you know, exaggerated. It's something, you know, if you were just picking up things to haul off, that's something you could easily haul, haul off. Especially if it's made of precious metal. Like yeah, sometimes. So how many of the people in Jacob's camps were still worshiping idols? Any idea? Oh, when they came out of, at the end of the uh, 40 years in the wilderness, they were yeah. still a bunch of pagans. Yeah. Well, the saddest part of this portion of Jacob's life was the death of Rachel during childbirth. Jim? Genesis chapter 35, verses 16 to 29. Jacob and his family left Bethel, and when they were still some distance from Ephrath, the time came for Rachel to have a, her baby, and she 
was having difficult labor. When now, this is her second baby. This would be Benji Benjamin, the one who later became Benjamin. When her labor pains were at their worst, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, Rachel, it's another boy. But she was dying, and as she breathed her last, she named her son Benoni, but his father named him Benjamin. Now, it's, we don't know enough information to even guess what, I mean, why do women die in childbirth? Most often, it's, it's probably bleeding. It happens uh, today, even. Yeah, oh yeah, it happens today, but not very often. No. Because um, we have medicines and all kinds. Infections, bleeding. But this very quickly lamps, yeah. thing like this. Uh, ruptured uterus. Yeah. But eclampsia or ruptured uterus, that would be, you wouldn't think you'd get a live baby out of it. When Rachel died, she was buried beside the road to Ephrath, now known as Bethlehem. Japus, Jacob set up a memorial stone there, and it still marks Rachel's grave to this day. Jacob moved on and set up his camp on the other side of the Tower of Eder. Good news Bible. Unfortunately, three interrelated incidents soon took place. One, Benjamin was born. We just talked about that. During that birth of Benjamin, Rachel died. And three, Reuben, Jacob's first son by Leah, then slept with Jacob's concubine. Now, this lady was almost certain. Well, I know she was old enough to be his mother. Benjamin was the only child of Jacob to be born in the promised land. The dying Rachel named her son Ben-Oni, meaning son of my sorrow, because of the pain in her dying process. Jacob, by contrast, named him Benjamin, meaning son of the right hand, meaning the, the blessed side, right? Despite all their problems and dysfunctional behavior, why did God continue to work with them? Don't you think it might have been better to go and work with the Chinese or the Japanese or somebody? Wow. I suspect he tried, yeah. and they did even worse. Very possibly. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of surprises when we hear the whole story of everything that happened, and everything with so many things we know nothing about. Well, imagine what God could have done with a family who all followed him carefully in every detail of their lives. You mean like Whoa. we do? Of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sarcastically? Yeah. Once again, we see that the lives of the so-called saints are filled with evil and sinful events. So why does the Bible record all those sins? And you know, I don't have to tell you, you this group, because we've all discussed this before, if you go back and look at the records from Egyptians or you look at the records of the Mesopotamians and so forth, what do you find? All, all victories. All victories and all the glorious uh, hunts that the, that the king does and he bringing back lions and so forth and so forth. Never any problems. He, everything just goes great. And does that make the story very believable? Makes you wonder, hmm, could this really be true? So, does the Bible record all those sins so it helps us to understand that they were real people? If nothing evil had been recorded about any of them, we would think that they were some kind of superhuman saints and clearly beyond our capacity to, my, to follow, right? Why do you think that at least some of them were enticed into practicing idolatry? Why would... I mean, well, I mean, try to think of what, why would people worship a chunk of clay or a chunk of wood or a chunk of metal? That can't move, can't talk. Like the guy was in Isaiah where he cut down the tree and, yeah. and the half of it he made a god and worshiped and then the other half he cooked, warmed his food. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well... I can only think that there probably were great all kind of orgies and parties and so forth that went on in connection with the, the worship of these fertility cult gods. Maybe that was an attraction. Um, I don't know. 
In this lesson, we have seen, one, the direct distress of Jacob as he approached Canaan and his brother. Two, Jacob wrestling with God and succeeding and having his name changed to Israel. Then three, Jacob facing his brother as if it was, as if it were the face of God. So what do we know about that terrible day which is coming, which is called the time of Jacob's trouble? Jim, I think that's yours. Uh, Carrie. Carrie, Carrie, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, reading from Zephaniah, chapter 1, 14 through 18. The great day of the Lord is near, very near, and coming fast. That will be a bitter day, for even the bravest soldiers will cry out in despair. It will be a day of fury, a day of trouble and distress, a day of ruin and destruction, a day of darkness and gloom, a black and cloudy day, a day filled with the sound of war trumpets and the battle cry of soldiers attacking fortified cities and high towers. Wow. The Lord says, I will bring such disasters on mankind that everyone will grope about like someone blind. They have sinned against me, and now their blood will be poured out like water, and their dead bodies will lie rotting on the ground. On the day when the Lord shows his fury, not even all their silver and gold will save them. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. We don't have very long, but here, what do we know about God's wrath, his fury? It's giving us up. Giving us up, stepping back and letting us reap the results of our own behavior. Okay, go ahead. The, uh, on the day the Lord shows his fury, not even all their silver and gold will save them. The whole earth will be destroyed by the fire of his anger. He will put an end, a sudden end, to everyone who lives on the earth. From the Good News Bible. Okay. In Daniel 12, 1, we have a simpler message, a sim similar message. At that time, the great angel Michael will guard your people will appear. Then there will be a time of troubles. And dropping down to Matthew 24, where Jesus refers back to that. He says, the awful horror which the prophet Daniel spoke of, etc. Many years later, Paul describes his experience of fighting with sin. That's Romans 7, 23 to 25. This then is my condition, he says. And finally, is this that experience something similar to what Jacob experienced? In our day, we also struggle with encountering people who have differences of race and culture and religion. And do we have trouble accepting them or do we accept them as Christian brothers and sisters? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these lessons which bring us nearer to you and give us a clear understanding of the ways in which you have re interacted with your children down through the years. As we look forward to the time of trouble, the plagues, etc., ahead of us, may we have the courage to do as Jacob did, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.